Hello, you're listening to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guests today are Dave Fagundes, Baker Botts LLP Professor of Law at the University of Houston Law Center, and Aaron Perzanowski, Professor of Law at Taste Western Reserve University School of Law. We'll be discussing their paper, Clown Eggs and Property Norms, which will appear in the Notre Dame Law Review. So welcome, Dave and Aaron. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Great. So I, I thought we could we could start out, but with just a really basic question for listeners who may not already be uh, familiar with your project. Um, what is a clown egg, anyway, and what what do they have to do with property norms? Oh man, Aaron, you want to take that one? Sure. So clown yeah. eggs are a, a fascinating uh, sort of unexpected art object that Dave and I discovered uh, a couple of years ago and have been fascinated with ever since. So starting in the 1940s, just after World War II in England, um, the community of clowns um, led by a non-clown, uh, but a sort of circus and clown enthusiast named Stan Bolt, uh, started to paint the portraits of circus clowns on uh, chicken eggs um, in order to create a sort of uh, a record or a register of those uh, makeup designs. And we came across uh, these eggs, I think in a conversation initially with uh, Chris Sprigman, whose uh, work in the uh, sort of IP negative spaces uh, area in particular, his work on, on stand-up comedy norms with Dotan Oliar, um, really inspired Dave and I to do some of our early work. And so we were having this conversation with Chris and um, the topic of these eggs came up. And from that point on, we were uh, both sort of uh, locked into a, a real fascination with this, uh, this whole uh, sort of culture surrounding the clown eggs. So what does a clown egg look like? And, and where would I see one? Well, there, there aren't that many in existence. Essentially it's, um, it, the, the early ones that were created by Stan Bolt, who, as Aaron explained, sort of started off this whole process in the mid-1900s, were actually uh, painted on blown-out chicken eggs, and they were very simple pencil drawings that uh, represented different famous clowns uh, performing at the time and from history. The more recent ones are actually painted on a somewhat larger ceramic egg uh, that is used the sort of the, the, the purpose of the egg is supposed to be uh, to put in for hens. I don't know a whole lot about uh, how animal husbandry works, but apparently if a, if a hen doesn't feel like laying eggs and you put in a fake egg, sometimes that will cause her to do it. Uh, so they're for broody hens. Uh, and then these somewhat larger ceramic eggs are painted and designed as well as not just with uh, paint, but also with sometimes accessories like hair or a little hat or collar or something like that. And that comprises the more modern eggs in the collection. And the ones that you would see, to answer the other part of your question, if you wanted to see them, there are really two places in the world where they are because they're uh, primarily created and organized by the organization Aaron mentioned, Clowns International. Uh, one location, the majority of them are at a place called Wookie Hole, which is a, a remote uh, location in South West England in a rural area, but it's sort of an amusement park that has one room devoted to clowns and one wall with a glass case that features the majority of these eggs. A handful of them are also located, are, are located rather in uh, England in the East End in the Clowns Church, where there is uh, a really great museum. It's no longer a functioning church, but uh, it's operated by the, um, one of the officials of Clowns International that goes by the name of Maddie Faint. Um, so those are the far more easy to access eggs. When Aaron and I did a research trip to England uh, last year, we, we drove all the way to Wookie Hole to find the other eggs, and it was, uh, it was a trek, but it was worth it. <laughs> so it's, it, 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 if I understand it correctly, the Clown Egg Register is operated and managed by Clowns International. 
how would I go about getting a clown egg of myself if I wanted one? In other words, who's entitled to get a clown egg and how would I go about getting one made? So one, one thing to add to, to Dave's answer to the last question, if you want to see these eggs, the, 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 the easier way to do it is to buy a copy of this wonderful little book called The Clown Egg Register that came out last year um, with photographs uh, by a guy named Luke Stevenson and text uh, by uh, Helen Champion, which is not an exhaustive catalog of the uh, eggs included in the register, but it has beautiful photos and short biographies of the clowns. So if you want to be included in the clown egg register, the first thing uh, you would need to do um, is to become a member of Clowns International. So the organization, um, with the exception of a few very famous and long dead clowns, uh, the organization only includes its members within the registry, which makes it a rather incomplete register of, of clown face designs. But in order to become a member, um, you have to actually be a clown. So one of the handful of circumstances that we discovered where Clowns International refused um, to um, include an egg applicant uh, in the register was when that person was not a sort of um, an actual working clown. They were, a, some, they were someone who sort of wanted a clown egg uh, for sort of the novelty of it. So they, they do try to limit the membership of the organization and the register to people who are really committed uh, to this form of expression, uh, to, to this art form of clowning. And even for those people, they encourage you to be a, a fairly uh, mature clown in the development of your persona because over time, uh, clowns <clears throat> evolve, they change their uh, appearance, they may change their character, and for the most part, you only get one shot at having your egg painted. So there's a, a sense in which they, they encourage you to wait until you, you're sort of fully formed as a performer. Interesting. So you, you refer to it as the clown egg register. What does that mean? What is a, what is a register anyway, and, and how does it work? Yeah, so the um, the register is actually somewhat different than the clown eggs themselves, which is how this ends up linking back to property. So the clown eggs themselves could just be a novelty, right? Stanbolt or others could just like to paint portraits of clowns on eggs. But from its inception, this practice was understood not only to be aesthetic and um, kind of a novelty, but was also meant to be a running organized list of the membership of Clowns International as an organization. So in addition to the eggs themselves, there's also a written register that lists the name of a performer, their government name, when they registered, uh, which is to say when they requested a clown egg, um, and some other information. So that the one of the officials we talked to of Clowns International said, to refer to the eggs as a register, which many people do, such as the Stevenson and Champion book that Aaron mentioned is kind of a misnomer. The register itself is a separate written record and the eggs are almost like deposit in copyright. They're a piece of evidence that allows you to um, have, you know, proof in the case uh, that there might be a dispute over the authenticity or the priority of your design. Uh, but the register itself is sort of a running history like a, you know, title recording of clowns, in Clowns International and when they establish themselves uh, as a performer with a given aesthetic design as reflected on one of the eggs. Okay, well do, do all clowns in the UK or in the United States participate in the register or only, only some of them? No, it's a pretty limited number of clowns who are included in, uh, in, in this system. So Clowns International's current um, collection includes around 250 eggs. Uh, it, so it's not a huge number. Some have been lost to time. So there were, there were more um, at, at earlier points. Uh, and there's a separate... Uh, collection of clown eggs here in the United States that was modeled off of the UK register um, that included at its peak I think about 600 eggs 
But there are thousands of clowns uh, in the United States, in the UK, and around the world, probably tens of thousands of clowns, if not more. And so the, the, the eggs really represent a, a fairly small slice of the overall clown community, which creates um, some interesting tension in this story that Dave has, has started to tell about the role that the eggs play as a sort of quasi property register. So, you know, what value could it really lend if it is so incomplete on top of the fact that it is uh, not terribly accessible because of its remote location. So that's one of the sort of puzzles that we were uh, trying to think through in this piece. So, so interesting. If, if I wanted to become a clown, say, for example, could I like go to the clown egg registry and see what other people have done? And if I were to copy somebody else's clown persona, would that, would that be a problem? What would happen? Yeah, so the, first, the answer to the first one is easy. The registry exists, or at least was conceived by its organizers precisely for that reason. Uh, the notion was that, you know, you could, or at least that's one of the reasons, you could observe the registry and sort of distinguish yourself from those who were on it. Um, and certainly if you were to, I mean, there's, a, there's like, this is true of many creative communities. If you were to copy someone else's uh, aesthetic design down to a certain level of detail, then one clear consensus that we found when we were talking to different clowns was that that's considered well out of bounds by the internal norms of that community. And so the, the problem is though, it's a, it's a coordination problem. Like how, how can you be sure that you're not repeating someone else's makeup if uh, you know there are you don't we can't account for all possible clowns that are out there performing and the registry is a helpful device to at least solve part of this coordination problem by allowing you to avoid overlapping looks um, through observing uh, the makeup designs recorded there. Okay, but it's I mean it seems like it's kind of hard hard to you like to the extent that it's relatively inaccessible and only includes a small fraction of the clowns who are out there. What about all those, what about all those other clowns? Um, and how do people know whether or not somebody is being copied or whether they're doing too much or too little copying? Well, to, to address, I guess, first the, the question of copying here, the, the community that we observe when speaking to clowns um, is in a lot of ways quite similar to other sorts of you know, norm-based creative communities that Dave and I and others have, have studied. Um, one thing that I think does set the clowns apart here is the relatively high bar for you know, what, we would, what we would think of from a legal perspective as infringement. So in order for you to kind of, um, to violate this norm against copying of makeup designs in particular, you have to create um, a nearly identical copy of another clown's look. They recognize it because there are all sorts of stylistic conventions within the world of clowning. There are different types of clowns that all have uh, sort of um, fairly clearly prescribed rules uh, about, um, you know, uh, makeup color and particular design features. So they understand that you have to sort of um, adapt existing designs in order to create something new. So making relatively minor modifications is usually enough to avoid violating this norm. But we did find several instances where clowns were accused of a sort of wholesale appropriation, not just of a makeup design, but a makeup design um, plus, you know, a similar act or a makeup design and the same name or a makeup design and the same costume and sometimes, you know, uh, multiple uh, sort of overlapping appropriations. And, and that's when you run into the, the clearest sorts of violations of the norms. So you, 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 talk, you, you talk about the clown egg registry in the context of intellectual property and ownership 
norms. Um, and I was wondering, do you see analogies to other forms of intellectual property, other kinds of property rights that 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 people use in order to demarcate, you know, what is and is not a socially acceptable activity? Yeah, I think the essential like aspiration, um, even if it wasn't executed perfectly, of the Clown Egg Register was identical to the aspiration of other property registers, title recording, copyright, um, you know, registration recording, you know, name it, uh, which is to say you establish some kind of exclusive rights and you put people on notice uh, that you have them, right? So that, that part, I think, is relatively straightforward. Um, I think what's interesting, though, is that the fragmentary character of the registry that you've pointed out sort of invites us to ask the question, well, what else is going on here, right? It's, it's clearly uh, an imperfect way to record and protect all different clown identities. Um, so, you know, then that's as compared to say, you know, land recording, right? You, you can be pretty confident that, you know, when you search land records in a given municipality in the United States, you're getting an exhaustive list of everybody who owns property there. Um, and that's not really true of, of this. So one thing that we thought about writing this paper is, you know, what other functions does the registry serve um, besides the sort of traditional exclusion function um, that is sort of most commonly associated with, with why registries exist and used as an explanation for why they happen as an institution. And uh, that's the place where I think there's some of the, the more interesting commonalities. It's not so much the sort of essential similarity to other registries, but rather the way in which they do things beyond just establish exclusive rights. So I, I wanted to return really quickly to a term that one of you used earlier, which people might not be familiar with, and that was intellectual property negative spaces. What do you mm. mean by that, and how does that relate to the Clown Egg Register? So... When I, when I use that term, I, what I'm referring to are creative communities in which um, the formal legal system is not the primary means by which creators understand and regulate their creative behavior and copying of their creativity. Um, so there are a number of instances of, of these kinds of communities that have been documented. So I mentioned Chris Sprigman's work uh, on stand-up comedy. Stand-up comics, for the most part, don't rely on suing each other for copyright infringement if one appropriates um, someone else's joke, for example. They have an internal set of community norms uh, that help to uh, sort of define and sanction those kinds of instances of, of appropriation. I've done work on the, the tattoo industry uh, where you see a very similar kind of um, uh, phenomenon at play. Uh, Dave has done work in the past on um, the uniqueness norm when it comes to roller derby pseudonyms. Uh, and we see a lot of commonalities, I think, within uh, those various communities. Sometimes they're relying on norms because formal law just doesn't extend to the things that they want to protect. Um, although in the case of, of the roller derby and, and tattoos that Dave and I have studied, those are both instances where formal law I think is pretty clearly available, but the community has its own sort of cultural and social preferences for self-regulation rather than formal legal regulation. And I think that is generally true of clowns as well. There are available forms of formal legal protection that they could rely on in the U.S. and in, in the U.K. in terms of copyright law and, and, uh, and trademark law and perhaps even the right of publicity. They don't do that for the most part. There are very few instances where clowns are leveraging formal legal structures. Instead, they try to keep this within their own community and, and regulate it in a way that I think is kind of more sensitive to the, the particular concerns that, that motivate them. So, so how does that work? I mean, if there's a perceived violation of the, the law of clowning, as it were, um, how are those, how are those violations? How are those infringements? How are those transgressions, um, policed by the community? 
Yeah, so um, we had some really interesting instances of where this happened. As Aaron points out, you know, there, there are some interesting preliminary uh, reasons that this infringement, you know, doesn't happen as often as you might think. Uh, one of them is that, you know, even if, if one clown wanted to copy another clown's uh, makeup down to the, the smallest detail, that might not actually end up looking very similar on the copying clown's face because everybody's sort of facial structure is different and makeup may just play out differently on someone else's face. So I think that there's, there are some interesting natural limitations um, because of the form and the community on how often these disputes arise. Uh, to the extent that there were instances, I think one interesting distinction is the sort of sense of perceived intention. So we talked to one clown, you know, he said that, you know, there, there are some instances where one clown may be doing something that overlaps with another, but it's obviously because the clown is, is a novice and sort of clueless, uh, and so a sort of gentle conversation is sufficient to solve that problem. We also heard at least, and I don't want to overstate this, but we heard stories where people at least intimated that um, there were some fairly heated personal interactions where they felt as though the uh, copying was more intentional and more designed to trade off of the, the fame or goodwill of a pre-existing clown. Um, and, you know, like this happens in a lot of the informal communi uh, creative communities people have studied. Comedians are sometimes actually quite overtly violent, uh, protecting the uniqueness of their comedy routine. So, you know, the idea is that this plays out informally, but, you know, we have a number of recorded instances where there's some kind of uh, angry exchange or at least, you know, hard words that lead one clown to, accuse, to sort of get the other to back off. Um, but one good thing about the registry is that it was designed to provide kind of a channeling device to avoid this kind of informal enforcement. And in the couple of instances where we have recorded examples of clowns using the registry as a way to identify and sort out uh, some kind of conflict, it tends to be much more um, much more civil. And I think there's less of a sort of sense of the need for this kind of informal, low-level vigilante enforcement and uh, something that happens more through the channels of Clowning International. Interesting. So... <clears throat> To the extent that the clown community and other creative communities are operating in these, in these quote unquote negative spaces, uh, kind of enforcing property rights or quasi property rights that are extra legal. Uh, in other words, r property rights that aren't kind of created and, and managed by, by the state. It sounds like it's sort of a mixture of shaming and maybe coercion that gets used. And I'm wondering, you know, how do we evaluate whether or not we think those kinds of enforcements and those kinds of kind of effective creations of certain kinds of extra legal intellectual property are something we should support or be concerned about? Mm -hmm. I, th I think there are upsides and downsides to these uh, to these sort of informal community uh, driven responses. The downsides we've already hinted at here, and I think they are significant and, and deserve some attention. And and there is in many of these communities, um, if not actual physical violence, there is the sort of lingering threat of violence, um, which you know occurs in all sorts of uh, instances of interpersonal conflict. My sense is, at least in the communities that I have studied, that the threat is uh, very infrequently backed up with any action. Um, there are other communities where there are documented instances of, you know, of, of stand-up comics, you know, punching each other and getting into, getting into brawls. Um, that does not appear to happen in the clown community, but it is, I think, a, a downside worth noting. The upside is that, you know, in addition to shaming plays an important role in sort of you know, negative reputational um, consequences for people within the community, another piece of this that, that emerged often was, was really about education. It was about taking people aside and saying, look, that's not how things are done in this community. These are the reasons why. Here's how you can avoid this in the future. 
and, and it provides an opportunity for sort of, um, you know, transmitting uh, values and principles to people who are kind of new to the community and maintaining a certain set of standards that if you were relying purely on an entirely um, external legal structure to decide what's right and wrong, then the community loses some degree of control, I think, over its ability to set the bar where it wants to set it. And in a lot of ways, I think the legal rules would probably be more protective of the sort of quasi-copyright interest in a makeup design than the clowning community is itself. And I think they should be free and in fact encouraged to set that bar where they think it's appropriate and necessary for their uh, form of creativity. So I think that's, um, that's one reason that we might want to, uh, if not favor, at least allow uh, these, these kinds of spaces to flourish. Right. So it sounds like you're saying there's a kind of expressive flexibility or maybe in like in econ talk terms, we could even say like the ability to work extra legally might reduce information costs for people entering the community. I think that's right. Um, and I think it also has the benefit of being able to, and it is maybe the same point, but essentially it allows remedies to be tailored uh, to context in a way that you don't see to take, you know, with, with copyright. I mean, you know, the, you know, the, the penalties are sort of outsized regardless of the magnitude of the violation. And so that flexibility is definitely an upside of um, informal enforcement. I think that, you know, and then of course, as Aaron points out, the downside is you don't really have any means of checking or enforcing that, you know. So if you, you feel as though there is some kind of disproportion between sanction and violation, then unlike in the you know, U.S. judicial system, the, the recourse is, um, there is really no recourse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in, in your paper, you suggest that the property norm aspect of the clown egg register is only part of the story and that there are other reasons that people seem to want to participate in it and, and join the register, as it were. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those and why you think they're important. Yeah, I can give kind of an overview of that and, and let Dave dive into to some of the details. But yeah, our sense was, look, the, the, the clowning community has been engaged for almost 80 years now in this incredibly elaborate, um, time-consuming, resource-intensive process of documenting clowns by painting their portraits on eggs. Um, why are they doing that? And it didn't seem to us that the answer could be completely driven by this you know, need for documentation or kind of providing an evidentiary basis or even putting clowns uh, on, on notice of these claims. So we started to think about, well, what else might motivate people to participate here? And, and we, we asked the folks that we interviewed, um, and we, you know, we talked to a dozen or so uh, clowns in the U.S. and in the U.K., uh, many of whom have had their uh, eggs painted. And, you know, the stories that they told us were much more about an interest in belonging, in being part of what they see as a sort of um, inclusion in this uh, prestigious and uh, within the clown community very well-known um, collection. Um, so the, that sense of belonging, that sense of prestige, I think was important for the individual um, clowns who participated. I think the motivations uh, were a little bit different on the side of um, the, the creators of the registry. I think they were at least initially more focused on those kind of purely um, property-based kinds of rationales. Interesting. Yeah. Right. And to okay. um, Maya, could you uh, follow up on that? Yeah, sure. Great. So um, I, th that's, that's all great. To, to mention another of these, the, the way Aaron set up is right. When you look at the register, you know, it's really not doing only the work uh, or all the work that you would expect of a really, you know, complete register. So we kept casting about for these other features it, it served. And so one that Aaron identified with this notion of belonging and prestige, which I think is very central. Um, a related notion is that 
a lot of clowns sort of spoke of it as a sort of historical record, both in the sense that, you know, the register reaches back and captures clowns that were around from before 1950 when the thing began, right? You've got Chocolat, you've got um, Grimaldi, uh, you have clowns that were not associated with it, who were contemporaneous like Emma Kelly. And so placing themselves in that sort of historical progression is something that was valuable. And also beyond its value to individual clowns, it's just interesting as a piece of evidence. You know, if somebody ever wants to do a history of clowns in the 20th century, you could, for example, arrange them chronologically and show the development of different aesthetic styles of clowning over time. Um, and then another very major consideration, uh, the extent that um, apart from traditional exclusion functions, was that it's the, the folks who spoke to seem to have a real desire for um, sort of professional credibility for a long time clowns were, were kind of regarded in the same class as like carnies, uh, outsiders to society, uh, you know, not sort of respected performers. And the folks who started the Clown Egg Registry were pretty clear that what they wanted was to portray their profession as one that was a profession and not just a sort of assemblage of like ragtag marginal performers. Uh, and the registry symbolizes this because it, it's a piece of evidence that this is a group that is ordered and thoughtful and has a sense of itself and keeps, you know, records. And a lot of the individuals from CI who worked on this were not primarily or at all clowns, but they were just interested in the culture of circus and clowns, and they wanted to sort of contribute this. Stan Bolt was a chemist. Uh, another person we spoke to was a clerk in the uh, law courts in London. Uh, and what they brought was this sense of professionalism, which also translates to individual clowns to the extent that at least, you know, in, in some ways, the fact of being in the register is a proxy for quality, right? It's, it shows that you're part of a professional organization, you've developed a distinctive persona and aesthetic, and you take the entire enterprise seriously. And someone can reasonably infer from the fact that you're in this grouping that you are a relatively higher quality performer than someone who uh, may not be. Wow. So it's like, it, it's like an, a prestige element or a legitimation element to the creation of the registry and to participation of the registry in the first place then. And yeah, one, of the other, sorry, one of the other things that the registry does that from the organization's perspective that I think is really important is, you know, as we talked about before, the registry is only open to members of Clown International. And so because the registry has become reasonably well known and gets a fair amount of press attention, I think it drives membership for the organization that clowns join up with CI in part because they want to be included in the register itself. And once they join, then that gives the organization an opportunity to communicate its norms and expectations, not just with respect to copying, but you know they have this. They have something called you know like the Clown Ten Commandments, mm. um, where you know they tell you um, you know never be seen eating or smoking in character. Um, you know um, treat people with um, you know kindness and respect, and you know it drives uh, the the it drives new clowns into the organization, and that I think furthers this goal of professionalization and legitimization. That's fantastic. Um, well, thank you so much, Aaron and Dave. This has been a great conversation. I wonder if you have any final thoughts about, the, about clowns, clown eggs, or the clown egg registry you'd like to leave people with. Well, one thing um, I, so I have one. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> um, I, so I was just going to say, this is what I always say is kind of off book, but I think it's worth saying. Um, it's really interesting the extent to which every single person we interviewed, a clown, was very suspicious because the accurate perception is that uh, there's a social belief now that clowns are, uh, you know, creepy or pervy thanks to sort of, you know, 30 years of, of you know, social tropes like, you know, poltergeist or Stephen King's It. Uh, and I think that's had a major effect on the profession. Kids no longer really find that they want clowns at their birthday party, they want, you know, a Marvel superhero or a Disney princess. And I think that's sort of a shame because my, my impression from all the people we interviewed was that these were, you know, 
sincere, decent people, and the only thing they wanted was to to bring people uh, laughter, even if they they used a way to do so that was increasingly dated. Um, so yeah, so that's my that's my my typical exit point. <laughs> Thanks so much. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. All right.